Good afternoon. It's, um, it's good to be here with all of you uh, who have joined us either by Facebook or um, CCTV or Zoom. I want to thank you for taking the time in your day to come and be a part of this conversation. I look forward to uh, the robust discussion that we're going to have and the questions that you can submit. Before I introduce the panelists, just a few things. Um, if you feel like you have a question, please go to the Q&A and it will be answered. Um, if we don't get to your question, please know that if you have submitted it to us, we should have your um, email address and we will get back to you with an answer. Um, Today, we're, we, this is our, I think this is our fourth uh, Facebook Town Hall uh, live conversation. And the idea has been that it's really important that every week that we are coming together to talk about the issues impacting our lives through the lenses of this pandemic and, and COVID-19. This week, we're really gonna talk about the impact that uh, this pandemic and COVID-19 is having on the lived experiences of immigrants in our community and throughout the state. As we know, um, Massachusetts has a very high population of immigrants, over half who make up our medical and scientific um, workforce industry. A third of our home health aides in Massachusetts, the people who every day are getting up and, and caring for people um, or are helping to save lives, one third of our home health aides are also um, our immigrants. A number of the uh, immigrants in Massachusetts who are working in our communities often have jobs in which they physically need to be present. So, uh, a number of immigrants in our communities, our neighbors, have taken on what are absolutely essential jobs, whether that is uh, working in grocery stores and in making sure that people have food or working in the healthcare industry. Um, and we also know that the, the pandemic has also had a really disproportionate impact on um, our neighbors who are immigrants. And, um, you know, in the same ways that we look at the disparities of income inequality and healthcare inequality, um, this virus has been no different and has been really um, ravaged many of our, um, our neighborhoods that have high populations of immigrants. And here we have a group of panelists who are gonna talk about why that is, um, what the experiences are, are we meeting the needs of immigrants in our communities? How are the needs of immigrants in our communities different? Not every, every immigrant community is experiencing this in the same way. Um, what are the inequalities around accessing resources and services? And what do we need to do more of? And, and how do we do better in ensuring that nobody is left behind, um, regardless of their, uh, their, their immigration status, their citizenship, um, or the neighborhood or zip code that they live in. And so I think we have um, an incredible group of people who are gonna speak exactly to that experience. And at this time, I always ask our, our panelists to just introduce themselves. So I will start with Victoria uh, Ramirez Morales. And uh, I wanna thank you for being here today. Uh, uh, the work that you do at ROCA and, and your colleagues do has been really a profound model for um, for many communities in Massachusetts. And we were excited to start hopefully ramping up some new work with ROCA um, based on some incredible work you've been doing in behavioral health that was going to benefit lots of people in Massachusetts. But here we have you today. If you could just tell us a little bit more about yourself. Now that I've just talked a little bit more about how much I love you guys and the work you do. Um, thank you for having me here. Um, so my name is Victoria and I am a representative today here in the panel for ROCA. Um, I am a youth worker um, for ROCA, uh, for the Central American initiative that we have. Um, we work with a lot of young men uh, that are immigrants in the city of Chelsea, Everett, East Boston, Revere, um, and all the, you know, the neighborhoods. Um, we work with them uh, through schools, um, through their immigration courts, um, uh, we work um, helping them, um, you know, get their um, educations, um, their problems that they have with um, their status, um, connecting them with the right resources to help them out. Um, but right now in the pandemic, what we have been doing is because we are working remotely. So it's kind of like our job is a little bit harder um, reaching out. Uh, we've been doing a lot of deliveries. Um, to the communities, the, key, the young men that we work with. Uh, we've been providing them with food because I know that a lot of families don't have access to that. Uh, we've been uh, helping a lot, connecting our young men that 
majority work with um, culinary uh, restaurants and they don't have access. I mean, they're all unemployed right now. Um, they don't act, have access to any money and, you know, we've been coming to difficulties of, um, with the unemployment to help them get those resources for them. And we've been uh, challenging, you know, uh, trying to get them to get through, to get the money. Uh, other things that we've been challenging is that a lot of tenants are, have taken advantage of these families and uh, there have been uh, evictions, um, you know, sending them out of their home due to whether they are being tested of COVID or because they don't have money to pay for rent and their bills. Um, so that has been hard to, for us to um, help and connect them with the right um, resources. Um, so I think what we'll do, Victoria, I think that we have a lot of specific questions that we'll ask you about. And at this time, we'll just quickly go around and ask everyone else if they could just, um, I, I will refrain from talking about how amazing you each are from my perspective and allow you to just introduce yourselves. And then I think we'll, we'll get into the conversation about um, what each of you are seeing. Um, Richard Sherwood, could you introduce yourself? Hi, thank you, Representative Decker. Uh, my name is Richard Sherwood and I'm the Director of Innovative Partnerships at Children's Health Watch, which is a national network of pediatricians, public health researchers, and child health policy experts headquartered at Boston Medical Center. We facilitate the Healthy Families EITC Coalition as one aspect of our work that relates to today, but we do look at research and policy opportunities that are gonna improve the health of all families, especially immigrant families with young children. Thank you. Marion Davis. Hi, uh, um, I'm Marion Davis. I'm Director of Communications for Mira Coalition. Our Executive Director, Eva Malona, unfortunately couldn't make it, so I'm filling in for her. Um, we are a statewide advocacy organization with over 130 organizational members, and we provide, um, we, we, we support those organizations in um, advocating for policies that will change specific um, issues, you know, that address specific challenges that are arising right now with the coronavirus situation. And we've also tried to develop uh, multilingual materials to be able to support them and help them through this difficult time. Thank you. Roxana Rivera. Oh, we can't hear you. Okay. Yes, thank you. Um, so I'm Roxana Rivera. I'm the vice president of SEIU Local 32 BJ. We represent um, 20,000 workers um, in the city of Massachusetts that work as uh, contracted cleaners, uh, security officers, um, and other workers, you know, at, in commercial office buildings, in airport, at Logan Airport, at, um, at several of the universities. Um, in the state of Mass. And uh, our members right now are working. There are, they are on the front lines. Um, they, they cannot work remotely. And um, so obviously we're dealing with a lot of the same fears and hearing the same fears from our members that um, I think a lot of the organizations here are facing. Uh, and uh, so thank you for having thank me. Thank you. Dr. Kirsten Meisinger. Hi, I'm Dr. Kirsten Meisinger from the Cambridge Health Alliance, um, uh, represented here as well with Dr. Saya. Uh, and, um, uh, and I am the outgoing medical staff president and have been a family doctor in the community actually for 20 years, caring for the same families, um, doing what CHA does best, caring for all. Um, we, uh, we bring care to the people and we care for everyone, um, regardless of their ability to pay their background, um, and we bring our whole selves to that work. Um, and I've been doing that for 20 years and, and love what I do every day. Um, and we're happy to go into detail about how our services are still very much available to our communities on this call today. Thank you. And uh, not the least, um, but Dr. Asad uh, Saya, could you introduce yourself? Hi, uh, my name is Asad Saya. I'm the uh, CEO for the Cambridge Health Alliance and also the Commissioner of Public Health for the uh, City of Cambridge. Uh, my background is um, I am an emergency physician. I practiced for 30 years in emergency medicine, 
and uh, also my background is in disaster preparedness. So I've been dealing with disaster mitigation preparedness for over 30 years. Most importantly, I am an immigrant. Um, I came to the United States at 17. Uh, no family, no money, no English. And, um, you know, through the perseverance and the hard work, um, as you all see and you all witness every day, uh, here I am doing what I'm doing and uh, being a resource for the community, my community, uh, and my culture and the community at large for the Cambridge Health Alliance. Uh, we are an organization that is built on a mission, a mission to care for a vulnerable population, uh, as Kirsten said, a mission to care for everybody, regardless of who they are, what's their background and their ability to pay. Uh, and I am uh, honored uh, and proud to be part of this organization. And uh, uh, thank you, Representative, for organizing this and being part of the effort and the force that's keeping us moving forward. Thank you. So we have a lot of questions here. And, and what I'm going to try to do is get to as many questions as possible. Um, I think the first question that um, maybe a few of you want to chime in first, this, this pandemic is it, hitting all of us. It's completely turned our lives upside down um, for people who did not want to believe that we had a mutual responsibility for one another's care or learning very quickly that our um, our survival really is um, dependent on our ability to care for everyone and leave no one behind. With that said, we also know that this um, has, at this time, disproportionately impacted um, various immigrant communities. And I guess, um, Roxanne, I'd love to start with you and sort of what your take on that. Many of your members are on the ground. Um, their livelihoods are threatened if they stop going to work. And they're the very same people who are risking their lives to ensure that um, we can go to work for those who have to and that they're being cared for and safe. What are you seeing with your members? So the majority of our members are um, immigrant workers, um, largely from black and brown communities. Um, and we're hearing from every day from them about their the fears that they have, obviously, of the issue of um, needing to go to work and not having enough personal protective equipment. Um, you know, the concern of them bringing that home to their families. Uh, we've had um, we've had a couple hundred members already test positive with COVID-19. Uh, we have, um, unfortunately, we have um, a handful of our members that have lost their lives in the last two weeks, uh, which has been particularly difficult um, for all of us uh, and, uh, and several other that are still in critical condition as we speak. Um, so there is a lot of concern in regards to uh, just safety on the job. And so we've been advocating, obviously, with those with the contractors and the institutions um, and building owners about the importance of making sure that contracted workers get those um, those resources. Uh, the okay, other issue is- Roxanne, I just remind people who don't know what the, who works at, who the members of 32BJ are, remind us what, the, what they're doing. So uh, the majority of our members are contracted cleaners. So they're actually cleaning office space. They're cleaning, uh, you know, the airport, they're cleaning universities. Uh, and so they're about 20,000 in total, as well as security officers. Uh, for example, the BCEC that was turned into a field hospital, our security officers are manning that, that, that um, event center. Uh, so they are on the front lines and they are concerned about having protective, um, personal protective equipment. Uh, they also, the other issue that we've been facing is layoffs. Um, we are faced with already around over 3,000 uh, workers being laid off. And this is uh, with many have only a one day notice. Um, so that has been a harsh impact on, on folks that can't afford to be laid off. Uh, and uh, this is, you know, something that, uh, again, we're advocating with the building owner community um, to think about how they're doing, what they're doing, um, and the impact that it has on, on, on many of our members um, that are struggling just to, to get by. And uh, so those, those, you know, those um, are the main, you know, things that we've been hearing in regards to, to folks. And, uh, but you can imagine having all those struggles and then being compounded by the issue of uh, one being undocumented, you know, and, and even though they are seen as essential workers because uh, contracted cleaners, security officers, you know, are seen as essential, but um, then, you know, but they're still not afforded the same government benefits that others are eligible for. And so um, that's been particularly hard. Um, 
uh, that fo uh, to to see that happen as well. Um, so we're we're continuing Thanks. to you know advocate the best we can um, uh, with with the um, clients and community here in Massachusetts. Thank you, and I think uh, Mary, maybe you want to comment on this. Um, one of the questions that's come through is so there are a number of people that if they qualify based on their income should be receiving stimulus uh, stimulus checks from the federal government. Um, and can you maybe speak a little bit more about how um, that has actually um, disproportionately been delivered or not delivered to um, immigrants and non-immigrants in same families who've been expecting that check? So those checks go, thank you very much. For, so uh, so the, these checks uh, are basically meant to go to all American taxpayers. Um, and actually the way that the IRS defines who owes taxes uh, they define a term called uh, resident alien and all sorts of people whose status is quite uncertain, like people with temporary protected status or with DACA are obligated to pay taxes. And those people do in fact qualify for, um, for the, the $1,200 or whatever fraction of that for the most part. But there is this glaring exception and it is for people who file jointly with somebody who is undocumented. As you may know, like lots of undocumented immigrants pay their taxes quite dutifully and they just use a, something called an ITIN, an individual taxpayer identification number, um, instead of a social security number. But people who file either by themselves or jointly with, uh, you know, with somebody who has an ITIN, they are being disqualified. So you can be a US citizen, you can have three US citizen children, but you filed with your wife who has an ITIN, the whole family loses that benefit. Uh, and that's just the way that the system was set up and it's cruel and incredibly unjust. And it's something that we seriously object to. Um, so it, and just it is highlights yeah. where maybe state governments need to also step in and figure out how do we address that disparity and that um, that inequality in assistance right now that's that the federal level has put in place. And this is also, by the way, compounded by the fact that the unemployment system is also designed in a way that doesn't allow people to collect unemployment if they don't have a social security number. So we are having to tell people who've lost their jobs and who have been paying taxes with an ITIN, no, you cannot apply for unemployment in Massachusetts because you're required to have a valid social security number. So the, the, the problem is double. So there is the two really big sources of income for people are gone. So th thank you. And I would say, Richard, can maybe you talk a little bit more about what you're seeing from your organization, who is predominantly pediatricians, who've been focused on the economic security of low-income people and in particular immigrant families? Yes, of course. And um, before I go into that, just to add on to the comments about I-10 holders, they're also excluded from the earned income tax credit at the federal and state level. And that's one of the best tools that we have at our disposal to keep people out of deep poverty and keep people out of poverty. Um, so there's another issue there. And we have a plan for that. And you do, yeah, you have a bill and we're a huge uh, supporter of it. Um, what we're seeing with the families that we've interviewed at Boston Medical Center, looking back at the Great Recession, the families that we talk to in terms of food insecurity, for example, while the general population saw a decline in food insecurity as the economy eventually recovered, the families that we talk to still have not returned to pre-2008 recession levels of food security. And so there's a longer tail for many, many families that come to Boston Medical Center to seek their care with their young children. And so thinking about how we recover from the COVID-19 pandemic and the economic nosedive that we're experiencing now is to think about long-term strategies and policies that are going to serve the needs of low-income families, and especially those uh, with various immigration statuses. Thank you. And then I, I would turn to Victoria. Your, your organization is based in Chelsea, which has been identified as one of the hot spots for people who've been um, who've come down sick with the virus, who are being impacted. I know the Cambridge Health Alliance has a strong relationship to the community of Chelsea, and many people are being um, cared for through the Cambridge Health Alliance. Can you talk to us about where you really see the disproportionate impact on um, people who you're working with, the young moms that you work with, um, and just the community in general? And 
what is it that you think needs to change or be paid attention to? Um, uh, what we, been, yeah, uh, what, what we've been seeing is that the misproportion is all, um, within the city is all the Central Americans, right? Um, these are the community, the, the people that it's here, um, they're immigrants, they're undocumented. Um, we are experiencing, uh, our young mothers not having, you know, their jobs, uh, their home with their babies. They are afraid of, you know, come out and, and get tested, um, for, uh, the disease COVID and because they're afraid to lose their kids. Uh, we're seeing on my own caseload, I have families that live in one bedroom apart, uh, in an apartment with three bedrooms, but they, they rent one bedroom and it's dad, mom, and my participant, and the family is testing positive too. And the whole family is unemployed. They're not getting the resources for them to buy food, um, pay their rent. Uh, so they have to come out, come out. I just learned that one of my participants had to come out and started working again. And he never went and got tested. Mom tested positive. Yeah. And their employer said to them, um, well, if you're not having the symptoms, then you're okay to work. So, so I, I think that, you know, I, if I talk to Dr. Um, Meisinger and uh, Dr. Saye, um, you're seeing what happens when um, people don't feel safe to um, economically safe. They don't have economic security to um, not show up on the job. They don't feel safe about their family security. If they have a mixed income status family, I guess I'd like to hear from both of you sort of how is that playing out in terms of what, how the hospitals being impacted and what are you, you know, what do you see that the, the communities and state and federal government need to do um, because of the connectedness to what's happening in the surge of the hospital? Oh, Dr. Saye, you're, uh, you're muted. But yeah, I think he was telling me to go ahead. <laughs> we, we've worked together many years. Um, so, uh, so I actually am in a clinic right now in East Cambridge and Gore Street and have been, we've been being very careful at CHA to see patients in primary care and in psychiatry, um, either in person when we know it's safe, particularly to give babies vaccines. And so I'm seeing a lot of families with exactly the concerns I heard mentioned by the panel and uh, mostly by telephone. So we're actually, thank you to the, the state of Massachusetts. And I, I really feel so grateful to people like Representative Decker and others who have really stepped up for our communities, being, um, being visionary in, in allowing us to use telephone care to care for our, our, our patients, for my patients I've cared for for 20 years has been just the best gift, I think, on both ends. Um, it's allowed us to reassure the families that we heard about from the other panelists that there is a way to help them. We can guide them to the direct resources. We actually can also give them direct medical advice. I would say the really tricky bit here is that my medical advice is not always what they're being told what is safe by their employer. And I, I think that is what the, the heart of the question that you were asking Representative Decker. And that is the part I think that's increasingly distressing for us as providers in the community, we know we know what we recommend medically and what we really want and prefer them to do. When families have stayed home on our medical advice, they've been told they now have no financial recourse. There are all of these slippery ways that my patients who are 85% um, from other countries um, are not getting the, the compensation that they deserve and they have paid into the system and been, they're just the most wonderful people. I mean, this is, these are all my families. I really genuinely feel like I have 200 kids and, and that many other um, adults because I'm a family physician. So, so the distress that we're feeling as well in the medical community is it has been uh, mitigated by the fact that I know I'm there for them and I can care for them in real time, either in person or largely 90% of the time, by the way, by telephone. So, Thank you to the state of Massachusetts and a challenge to please try and continue to work on these resources. I can only give a medicine for, I can give antibiotics, but I need people to have food. Food is medicine and we know that. And Cambridge Health Alliance has been one of the leaders in the community in trying to make sure that people have what we call 
social determinants of health, really, really the basic things that you need to be a healthy human being. Um, and I, I defer to Dr. Saya in terms of other um, uh, executive level strategies, um, particularly as a public health um, commissioner, but really uh, just as a voice of someone who's seeing patients every day right now, um, I am feeling the increasing distress from my, my folks, and, uh, and I am getting increasingly distressed because the, the, the medical issues are turning into social issues very quickly, but because, of, um, because we've been able to continue our routine care in so many different modalities, I'm, I'm absolutely confident they're getting good medical care. So, Dr. Saye, I would say if um, immigrants in our community don't feel like if they, if they stop working, they don't have an actual avenue for economic security. They, they, don't, they can't get unemployment. They can't get any of the stimulus. So either work and have some money coming in or don't work and have no money coming in. Um, um, if you uh, reveal yourself as being sick or in need of help, the fear of what happens if you have a mixed income, a mixed status family, right? So if those are the fears that are driving families to either seek help or not seek help or prohibit them, what does that mean for um, for your for the health alliance and organizations around um, the state and for people who are um, not responding to the and moving those obstacles out of the way? How do why why should the rest of us care? I mean, I well, see that everyone here knows why, but please tell us more. Well, the, the issue need is multifactorial. And somebody said that COVID-19 does not discriminate between the haves and have-nots. I would venture to say that it definitely does discriminate between the haves and have-nots. And the have-nots are at a major disadvantage in the situation because they cannot practice uh, social distancing. They cannot practice appropriate uh, uh, isolation. They cannot practice uh, uh, appropriate management of, of uh, uh, limiting the infectious and the spread of the disease because of the way that they live. Uh, and a lot of, I'm not going to go to the same reasons, you all covered all the other reasons. When you have a family that's living in one room, when you have three families that's living in one apartment, uh, there's no way that they can practice social isolation. When one of these uh, families or one member of the three families that are sharing an apartment is working and is exposed, everybody in that apartment is exposed. Now, one can say, yeah, okay, they're exposed, but at the end of the day, it takes everybody to be able to manage this disease. And if not, if, if, if we don't uh, practice uh, social distancing as a community, this is gonna continue and it's gonna affect eventually all of us. And that's how the haves are gonna get affected because if we don't get this under control, it's gonna be around a long time. It's gonna remain in the community a long time. Many people are gonna get sick and they're gonna promote that infection to other people whether they live in the same apartment, in the same neighborhood, go shop in the same place, walk in the same park, et cetera. So it is all our responsibilities to be able to provide the right environment and the right support to every single person that resides in that community to be able to control this. That's one piece. The second piece from a, a healthcare point of view, uh, if we don't provide the, the access, the screening, the food security, the health, the, the support, the treatment, we are not gonna be able to limit the spread of this disease and we're not gonna be able to control it. And eventually when there is a vaccine, if we're not gonna be able to provide the vaccine for everybody, we're not gonna be able to control it from the ability to manage the spread the next time this comes around, which probably it will. So, so this is not today, this is not tomorrow, this is ongoing, whether we are dealing with COVID or we're dealing with the flu or we're dealing with anything. You know, this is a social situation, not only a medical situation. And if we don't approach it both medically, socially, and economically, we're not going to be able to manage this as a community and get it under control. And at the end of the day, regardless of who we are, where we live, and how much we have, we're going to get personally affected, both economically, financially, and personally. And maybe one of our kids are going to be infected somewhere because they go to the same school with other people. It's all, we're all in this together. We cannot turn a blind eye to this, regardless of who we are. And that's the message that I would give to everybody, regardless of the way they work, particularly in people that have the, the, the power and the influence to make a difference. We all do to a certain extent, but it does take a village and everybody looking and advocating uh, uh, for, for, for the situation, particularly for the people that have no voice and they have no way to advocate for themselves. 
Thank you. I mean, I, I think so, you know, based on the conversation and, and conversations that I've been having around this, it's one, you know, government needs to quickly assess where are we falling short? You know, lot, some people are getting resources and some people are not. What, what can state government do when the federal government actually makes it harder to access care or safer to care? We know that anyone getting testing should be able to access testing without their immigration status being questioned. That, that is supposed to be the law. But if people don't know where to go and are afraid to ask for help, um, then, then it's not going to happen. Um, we also know that um, we need our private sector engaged in this as well. We need our private sector talking about um, how, what role they're going to take to ensure that people who work for them um, are, are safe, are healthy, and are going to be cared for when they're not safe and healthy and have access to care and access to, um, to economic security when they're not able to work. Um, I, one of the things we think about yesterday, Governor Baker talked about the school closing for the rest of the year. And um, I, I know that that, um, I think I was a little surprised talking to people who felt really um, sh shaken up by that because I, I, I knew six weeks ago we were never coming back. Um, I will say quite frankly, I, I don't see us going back in the fall. Um, that hasn't been said and I, you know, I definitely err on the side that I believe it's government's responsibility to be upfront um, and talk about what we're, we're, what we're facing um, so that we can actually all start thinking and planning uh, we don't overwhelm people and then leave them with that. We tell them this is what we're looking at and let's start planning. But I think about um, particularly our, our immigrant neighbors and friends, um, what the impact of no school for the rest of the year means to them, what it means in terms of not having um, summer um, programs available. And I, I guess, um, Roxanne, when you think about your membership and, and their families, um, and that your membership, you know, you represent people who, for the most part, are still going into work right now and have to, and what it means for them to be exposing themselves and leaving their children alone, or not always um, in the, the most, um, the safest environment or the most um, stimulating environments. Um, I, I guess I'd like to hear, you know, what are your hopes and from when you hear from your members, what are their concerns around this? So obviously our, our, the, the issue of um, just being safe at work is the number one thing, because again, the concern of having to, you know, come home to their children. I mean, the whole issue of schools not going back is a whole other challenge. And again, like what you said, as far as being a, for folks, a, a big gift for folks in this, in this, in this environment is that folks actually do have time to plan. And that's why it's been really harsh to see a pretty significant building owners in downtown Boston actually um, give folks a day notice that they no longer have a job, you know, and that that is that is particularly like, you know, very harsh um, because it's very hard for people to plan. OK, what, what you know, it, it, you know, how do I get it? it connect to unemployment, how, you know, what am I going to do in the interim? Because it's weeks before people get a first check, right? And so that, and that's if they're, they are eligible, right? Um, given their documentation status. And so it is, um, you know, it is an overwhelming situation. And so that's why it is as much that we can, you know, play a voice to like basically plan better as far as, um, and, and not be like what has happened in the last four weeks. I think we have a better chance at getting at managing this in the best way that we can. Uh, we have been an issue of people working uh, because you know there you know there is talk about the economy we're opening up again and 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 folks uh, coming back. You know, for example, office. Uh, workers come back into the building and, and, and needing to bring back workers that potentially have been laid off up to now uh, or universities, whether they are opening or closing and what does that mean for workers on campus and all of that, you know, we have been pushing for the, uh, for, for the universities and institutions and clients to take seriously the issue of personal protective equipment. Uh, actually, uh, in ways in which people are gathering, right? Because, um, uh, for example, at the airport, we had issues where people were cleaning planes and going into a, whole, a, a van with 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 many people grouped up in a van together from one plane to the next. That those types of things needed to stop, 
right? And we were, we really pushed for those things as far as how do people punch in when they come into work, right? That they're not gathering. And you're talking about large locations, right? Universities, you know, is universities and the airport are where we first saw the the um, uh, folks contracting COVID-19, right? And then actually having to doing the contact tracing, right? Right. And really actually giving information um, to the, the uh, institutions and uh, the clients about um, ways in which they could uh, reduce the, the, the exposure to, to workers, you know, and um, that is, you know, continues to be a continual conversation uh, with folks, but really them taking this seriously and understanding that they do have to put in protocols about this if they're going to have workers working. Um, and uh, that is, you know, my hope is that we can actually continue continue that conversation and, and really, uh, again, plan with as many protocols that we come at, from what we've learned up to now in the past couple of weeks. Um, thank you. And I, I guess, Richard, I think you've been following a lot what's happening with the federal government. And I, I guess between you and Marion as well, what are the policies that you think this, that the state of Massachusetts really need to be focused on, both on economic security um, as well as um, anti-immigration policies that now are actually serving to um, scare people, hurt people, who then unknowingly um, are infecting other people as well because of policies in place that are making it really hard for people to access care that they need. So if it may be rich, if you want to start talk, if you want to maybe share a little bit more of your thoughts or, you know, what would you like to see states do? Um, and, and what role, what continuous, what things should we also lobby the federal government to do? Of course, I think that there's a, a huge role here uh, in terms of leadership between state government and federal government because there's no way that we're really going to be able to dig ourselves and our neighbors out of this mess without support from the federal government and so you know thinking about food insecurity in the summer with school um, not coming back and kids being out of probably summer camps all summer pandemic ebt having school meals provided on uh, ebt cards is one thing that Massachusetts just got approval for, but making sure that that continues, not just through the end of the school year, but through the summer is incredibly important. So um, that sort of thing is very important. Also, I know the state is seeking a waiver to allow uh, SNAP participants purchase uh, food online and have it delivered so that they can practice social distancing a little uh, more successfully. So that's another thing. But really, I think what this is gonna come down we to- are, but I gotta tell you, I spoke to the governor's office no, I was just saying that the governor's office, when they called to tell me that they were looking at trying to um, enter. So what it is, is they're trying to make Massachusetts part of a, ma a pilot that's happening at the federal level, where if you have an, if you're an EBT card holder right now, you can't order online. And they called to let me know that we were, so this is still about at least two months away. But my other comments to them, as well as to the attorney general I've reached out to is, there's also a lot of price gouging going online. You go online and go to Instacart and they will tell you that some of the stuff costs three times more. You can pay $8 for a gallon of milk. But if you went to the store, that same gallon of milk could have cost $5.25. So this is a tension where we need to make it easier for people to stay home. But we also need to really pay attention to the price gouging will start to really matter more for those who have limited resources. Sorry, Richard, go on. No, no, that's absolutely true. And, and the delivery fees associated with that aren't allowable or covered under, under SNAP. So that's another- Or a tip. Another, yeah, no silver bullet by any means. Um, but you know, the last thing I'll say, and what I really think this comes down to, is the federal government issuing direct cash transfers on a monthly basis to families, regardless of their income or immigration status, until we get through the thick or the acute phase of this crisis. Um, there was a great report that just came out from um, the Heller School, the Institute on Assets and Social Policy, looking at um, guaranteed basic income. And I, I think that's one uh, probably unlikely, but certainly necessary tool that we could use. Thank you. And, and Marion, what are you seeing around the, you know, there's a lot of anti-immigration policies, even, even just this morning, the, the yeah. president's tweeting out about them. Um, and I know that there's been a, you know, and, and when we talk about immigrants and anti-immigrant policies, I think it's also important to like, 
the immigrants are not a homogenous community, right? So we're, we can be talking about people who are refugees, immigrants who are being detained, immigrants who are here legally, who have, um, uh, who don't have citizenship, but who have ITN numbers. If you could just talk to us more about what we should be trying to push for both at the federal level and at the state level. So this, the federal government has been absolutely horrendous. I mean, there are so many things that they're doing wrong uh, from, you know, flying people who are infected with coronavirus to Haiti and to Guatemala, to uh, also, you know, to, to keeping people behind bars on civil immigration charges right now where they're exposed to tremendous dangers to uh, just, I mean, and, and now with the president, you know, wanting to ban immigration, like that's gonna make any difference for anybody re-election campaign. So there's, you know, I think the federal government, the, we we appreciate all the fine efforts of our Massachusetts delegation to, to try to help. But right now, my biggest priority is what can the state do? And I think that the state can make a really big difference. And you talked about the earned income tax credit. That's one thing. We need to urgently, urgently need to strengthen our uh, earned uh, sick time uh, policies because Nobody should have to wait at all to earn sick time. If you're sick, you should be able to go and be healthy. And the other thing is we also need to make sure that there's a lot of outreach in multiple languages, on TV, on the radio, on at bus stops, wherever, to tell people these are your legal rights. So employers know that they're on notice, that they cannot make a person work when they're sick or when they have a sick kid at home or a sick wife. And then the other thing that's really, really important is we urgently need to address the housing situation. Victoria spoke a bit to this. You know, there, we have a lot of people, this, the most vulnerable people in our communities are living packed like sardines in apartments for which they're being overcharged. We have people, you know, three or four families can be living in a single apartment. I've been told people rent porches. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that porches were housing, but now they are. And so what's happening with that is that we need, you know, the raft program has $50 million. That's nothing, that's peanuts. And applying for the raft program is almost impossible. The web page that the state put together, they don't even tell you, they don't even give you the ability to find what agency serves your town. The information is only in English. I actually personally translated into Spanish and sent the translation <laughs> to see if that would at least, if they'd at least post what I wrote them. Um, but you need information that makes it clear how to get there. And we need to make sure that the agencies also have the ability to actually connect people to RAFT and that the RAFT is properly funded. Um, and we also need to, you know, it was fantastic that this moratorium on evictions was adopted, but the reality is that people who are subletting, which is what's happening in a lot of the cases that Victoria described, these are not people who are, you know, landlords don't rent out rooms. They rent out an apartment and then the, the, the rooms get sublet. Those people don't really get any protection and we need to figure out how to help them. And this may be through collaborations with community based organizations. It may be, you know, private uh, public private partnerships with hotel owners or different situations. But we have to create a way for people to be able to safely move out of dangerous conditions. And we also need to make sure that people who think that they've been exposed can be tested even if they're not hacking out a lung and aren't you know running a huge fever because the time for rationing tests as the way that, that has been done it, it, we cannot actually reopen our economy if we continue to ration tests and if we continue to have enormous numbers of people who get sick and recover and never got tested um, because we have no idea what the infection rate in our communities is thank you um and I know I say thank you, but we you know, when we're not on screen, we're actually having a lot of conversations with Mira and other organizations about where else the state should be moving forward. Um, Victoria, can you talk a little bit? And, you know, in my role as a legislator, I also chair the Committee on Mental Health, Substance Use and Recovery. And um, the issue of how people are accessing mental health services is one that I, I'm paying a lot of attention to. I do worry that there's not enough conversation in the meetings that I'm having um, every week around um, access. Um, I'm not hearing more about how immigrants are faring in access to mental health services. And so, um, as you know, I've been actively reaching out to organizations, people who really are on the ground working with people saying, is, is this working? Are we, are we reaching people who need help? Um, so if you could just talk a little bit about, I know that, that you work with um, 
uh, a lot of young people around mental health needs, and um, but also the uh, the immigrant communities in Chelsea. Are people getting the help that they need it? And what else do we need to be doing? Yes, um, we uh, as Broca as an organization, we are using a lot of the platforms. Um, online like FaceTime our kids or um, uh, Zoom and we are using a lot of our, our curriculum of CBT, Cognitive Behavior uh, Theory, that we have uh, in placement in ROCA. So we, we do a lot of out, you know, social distance outreach in uh, our kids that have substance disorder and we have a few and um, but the, you're right, there's not a lot of help on that. Um, so we try to also outsource our resources in the community like uh, North Suffolk and other communities to help out. We have sessions online with one of our um, uh, clinicians that works with us, with our kids, but it's, it's, it's very difficult because there's not a lot of, uh, of the help out there, you know. So even before this pandemic, we knew one of the issues was a shortage in people who actually provide services that are appropriate, that are culturally appropriate and, and also um, in, in the appropriate languages, right? Accessibility. Correct. And so we do know that the, the, the impact this is having on um, in all of us, on, you know, I don't know anyone who's not struggling with this in terms of their own <laughs> mental health, but now have all these other issues that you're struggling with in your family around economic security, immigration status, um, underhoused, not in safe conditions. And so um, I, I guess I would say to you before I, I pivot back over to um, our, our, our doctors at the Health Alliance, what else do you think um, the state could be doing to connect and engage and support services um, of the families that you're working with? Definitely um, trying to help them connect them more with, with the help that is out there for um, clinicians and, and um, you know, medical stuff. We have a lot of kids. Well, everybody is experiencing right now <laughs> mental health. Me personally, you know, it being remote, uh, working remotely, it's it's affecting everyone. Um, but our kids really need it. I have a few of my my young men that are suffering from these uh, um, disease, um, alcohol. Um, you know, other type of drugs, and I'm not able to provide them with the right services, you know, bringing him out of the apartment and trying to get them help, get him into um, detox, you know, and stuff like that. It's, it's really hard. And I think we need a, a, a more of that. Yeah. So I guess I would ask Dr. Meisinger, Meisinger, what would be your concerns right now where you feel like um, you have this long-standing experience um, with a number of immigrant communities um, in and around Cambridge, Chelsea, Everett, Revere. Um, what else would you like to see um, happen in order to better meet the needs of your patients and their families? So uh, one of the things I think I want to make sure to mention is that um, Cambridge Health Alliance is taking new patients. Um, we know that exactly the population that Victoria is talking about are, are folks who don't often have primary care uh, providers because they're young and healthy and, and until now they hadn't really felt the need or, or they're in the midst of, of a chronic disease like alcohol use or, or substance use disorder. And so we are taking new patients. Um, CHA has a huge commitment to mental health. We have actually um, turned um, as many visits into telephone consultations as we had face-to-face -face consultations in our psychiatry department um, as we had um, uh, over just the, the course of just this one month. Um, and, we're, um, and we're at uh, something like 75% of our regular primary care visits. So please do reach out if you have a clinician that you trust. And if you don't, please reach out to get one. Um, that, I think, is probably in Massachusetts the best way to get any kind of care because one of the things that I worry about as a primary care physician is that people are getting haphazard care, right? A little bit here, a little bit there. They go to an urgent care. They talk to someone on the phone. They use a relaxation app, and it's not what they need. What they need is a professional who is de as devoted to them as they are to themselves, and that is what you have. It's such good care in Massachusetts, not just at CHA, but, but in many other places. I happen to be a CHA um, enthusiast, as you can see. 
um, because this is the things that I think really matter to people are what we've always focused on. And thank you very much again for the support you've given to us over the years to be able to do that. So, but in, in terms of what's lacking, um, you know, is really the ability um, to get the word out that everybody deserves care and, and can access it right now. Um, again, lucky to be in Massachusetts, just so happy to be here. When I talk to my colleagues around the country, it is much harder to be anywhere else. Um, so I actually have a lot of gratitude, and I think all of the pieces are in place, but we have to get the word out. So that's why I love um, forums like this, the ability to, to network with community groups and organizations. Please send us folks you're worried about. We are absolutely here for them. Um, we have open arms always, um, and that that we've also just to so folks know specifically for substance use disorder, we have maintained our um, injection services, and we have maintained all of our um, services that we feel are truly essential to the community. There is no, we're not stopping the regular treatments because of the, the disaster. And as wonderful a job as Dr. Saya is doing at the hospital, we are still maintaining the services to our community because we know how essential that is. So please don't tell people not to pause. Tell people to come in and get the help they need now. Um, you know, I, I thank you for saying that because I think there's been a lot of mixed messages out there, right? Stay away from the hospitals. That's where, you know, people who are sick with this virus are. And that's not the case, right? We, if you're sick, we want you calling your doctor. If you don't have a doctor, I mean, I think one of the things that you know, and, and Dr. Say, I'll ask you to comment on this, you know, what makes Cambridge Health Alliance and, and Boston Medical Center so incredibly important to our state is we're safety net hospitals. We don't turn anyone away. You know, you're sick, you don't have insurance, you don't have a job, you still get the same care that I get with the highest level of insurance coverage, right? So same doctor, same care. And that becomes, um, but I worry about that model because even on our best days, and I say our, I've been getting my care at the Cambridge, when it was the Cambridge Hospital, um, and now it's the Alliance, right? So I do think of this as like that I'm a part of, this is my hospital, because I think that's what many of us think. Um, and a, 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 safety net, a safety net hospital, it is our hospital. Um, but that's not the way our healthcare system is built throughout the state or, or throughout the country, right? Not every hospital is our hospital, and hospitals also choose who they serve um, prior to COVID-19. So even on our best days, we were always struggling on the margins. And now here we are, not only are we struggling and dealing with the same expenses that many of our, um, our other hospitals who are not safety net hospitals, um, they, they don't take everybody. I think right now our people are trying to, so I don't wanna suggest that somebody would be turned away at another hospital, but the resources are different. So Dr. Syed, what does it mean for safety net hospitals who even today are saying to everybody, uh, immigrants, low-income people, people who are dealing with substance use disorders. Um, we also have a robust program for seniors and seniors who are immigrants as well. What does it say when we're saying, keep sending people to us, we will care for you, but I worry about where we're going to be in six months. And what would you say to the state, in particularly knowing that the majority of immigrants in our state are getting their care through the safety health, the safety net hospital networks? What, 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 would you, what do you think we need to be paying attention to in order to continue doing that? And can we? Well, I mean, these are, these are big questions that not only we're dealing with at the state level, but these are big questions that we're dealing with on a national level. And um, there is so much demand in there that the safety nets cannot, uh, cannot possibly care for all the patients out there with all the demands. We are a community and the healthcare community needs to share the burden and share the privilege of caring for everybody that's out there. It is a privilege. It is not only a burden, but it is a privilege. And, and I'm not saying the burden is a financial burden only, but there is a bandwidth. Uh, you know, if you have bandwidth so big and you have demand so huge, uh, it's not fair not to provide everybody with all the resources that one should get because your bandwidth is so small. I think that that should be spread across all organizations. And we are fortunate to be in the hub, maybe not only nationally, but internationally, of the best healthcare that one can get anywhere. Uh, and that best healthcare that one can get anywhere should not be uh, split between who can access it and how easy can, can it be accessed and why. I think it should be accessed across the board the same way by everybody at the right level at the right place. We have a very important role uh, as an organization 
that we provide out there in the community. We are a primary and secondary care organization that we're out in the community, mainly providing uh, primary care and, uh, and behavioral health, uh, the vast majority of our work with some secondary care and tertiary care within the hospital, but not to the same extent as our partners uh, in the Boston teaching area. So we have a role and they have a role and that care should be continuous and could be and should be bi-directional and that should continue across the board, but it should be coordinated. It should not be left to, 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 uh, uh, to the way that things just flow. It should be planned, it should be coordinated, the resources have to be there and the incentives have to be there across the board for for everybody to care at all patients the same way not only the safety the safety net hospitals but the major teaching hospitals should have the same incentives whether it's economical or social or psychological or community or whatever you need it the incentive should be there because at the end of the day we're all in this together and COVID really levels the, the playing field there's no question about it and that's why you're seeing a lot more collaboration across the board and we should maintain and sustain that level of collaboration forever. This is not should not change like a switch should not stop after this and be turned off. Um, so so it is the, the the duty for everybody to do this. I'm gonna just pivot just for one minute, but I think because there's there's a piece that's absolutely important that I think should be covered in here. That is uh, we we work uh, in 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 an, in an organization that serves the safety nets. And there's a reason why it just happens that our geography is becoming a hotspot uh, for COVID. The reason that our geography is becoming a hotspot a, a hot is because of what we talked about earlier. It's because it's an area of high density occupation. Uh, it's an area of high density uh, living and people are really living close to each other. And uh, it's an area that people have to go out and work to be able to provide for their families. So they cannot practice what we are expecting from everybody. And that, that, that our ability to be able to reverse the trend and flatten the curve has to address those two issues. We have to address the ability of people to provide food for their family without being out there and their ability to, to, uh, to uh, self, uh, uh, to, to experience and express uh, distancing, social distancing from each other. And one of the ways that we should be able to do this is with the programs that we are advocating for and the state has to, uh, has to provide. And I would, I would say that uh, testing, as Marion said, is absolutely critical. We haven't been able to roll out testing as we planned a month ago because we have no testing kits. And until yesterday, that was the first time we received swabs from the state that would work. We are into this almost a month and a half. And as an organization that opened the first drive-through testing area in Somerville, in all of Boston metro area, before all the Boston teaching hospitals, and we were planning to open two more within a week, we put them all on hold now for five weeks because we have no swabs. So, so you know, if, if we are the organization that is structured to care for the community in the hotspot, and we don't have the, the, the testing ability, the kits, I mean the swabs. We have the personnel, we have the, the readiness, we already made the organizational structure and the funding to do these tests, but we can't get any swabs. How are we gonna reverse the structure? So to that point, uh, this week, we're gonna expand the testing in Somerville for the community. Historically, we only do it for the Cambridge Health Alliance. Next week, we're hoping to open the second testing uh, now after five weeks. Uh, second testing drive-through tent at Malden, and hopefully soon we'll do a third one in Cambridge. But we have to do this. And the other piece that we've done is we have expanded our post-acute care with partnership with Tufts Medical School, with Tufts University, to be able to decompress the hospital and keep our door and access open for the people that need this care. We need, as a state and as a, a country, to provide opportunities for COVID positive, low symptomatic people that cannot self isolate at home because of living condition to have another opportunity to self isolate somewhere else. We're trying to do that at Tufts for our patients 
that when they test positive and we tell them go home, you don't need to be in the hospital, they don't go home to a place where there is 20 people in the same apartment. They can't do that because all 20 people are going to be sick. We have to evolve into that, uh, to that level. It is a continuum that doesn't stop with the community and with the hospital. We all into this, in this together and we have to combine all opportunities and forces to limit this. Wow, um, thank you. Uh, I wanna say thank you for all the work that all of you are doing. I have a few thoughts that I wanna share before we wrap this up, but if there's anyone here who, uh, your time is incredibly valuable and I really appreciate that you chose to come on here today. Um, and if there's anything that you would like to make sure that you know people hear before we um, say goodbye, I'd like to just invite you to do that now. I just wanted to put in a very quick plug for our multilingual COVID-19 resource page, miracoalition.org slash coronavirus. Can't miss it, coronavirus, right? If you go to our website, it's the first thing that will splash at you. We have a Q, an FAQ in Spanish as well, but our main multilingual resource, has tried to really address all the main issues that immigrants and other people are having, whether it's health or unemployment or needing food. And we really, really hope that people will come and use it. And if we're missing something that you think would be fantastic, let me know, because I will personally put it on there five minutes later. Thank you, Marion. And we're gonna also share those resources after this as well. Um, anyone else? So I want to say again, thank you for all of you. Um, I mean, the, my takeaways on this, it really just affirms where I believe every um, leader, every organization, every elected official, every question that we try to address has to be done through the lenses of, are we meeting the needs of the most vulnerable in our communities? And that is immigrants, both documented and undocumented. It's our elderly. Um, and it's also people with compromised immune systems, right? This, this is affecting everybody, but disproportionately the impact is being felt quicker and stronger by those who are more vulnerable. Um, and the state also has a really important role in driving that conversation, right? We can't just leave it to some of our hospitals to figure out how to care and help um, individuals isolate where going home is not gonna, not doing that at home is not gonna happen safely, right? So if you happen to be fortunate enough to live in this community that, or the community that's serviced by the CHA, you do have a place at Tufts University to go home and to go recover and, um, but, but that can't be the way we do this, right? So the lenses of every decision that all of us are making must ask, um, it, it can't be an afterthought, right? And we know it's an afterthought because the unemployment website put up by the state took over four weeks to be um, in, translated into Spanish, right? If these are the things that are happening all at once, then it's not an afterthought. And our, our ability to survive this really is so intertwined. And, and so we cannot afford to have anybody in our community be an afterthought, and in particularly communities that have always been an afterthought when they don't have representation at the table from those who are making decisions. And all of you represent um, voices that have demanded to be at the table, have gotten um, appointed to be at the table, have won the ability to be at the table, and are really pushing um, leaders in all of our industries, whether it's in the private sector or in government, to make sure that they that um, that immigrants are central to the decisions that we're making. I also want to remind people that if you live in Cambridge, the city of Cambridge has a mayor's relief fund. That fund um, it was about three and a half, close to four million dollars. Um, you apply, it's on the website, it's in multiple languages, and your, um, your, your status, your citizenship status is unknown. Nobody cares whether or not you are here as, as a DACA or that you're here um, undocumented or that you are a document, you will have access to resources. It is going to be incumbent upon us as a state to figure out how immigrants throughout Massachusetts have access to cash, to food, and to medical care. And uh, that is, um, a role that I take, um, I take heavily and seriously, and I, I have a lot of colleagues I know who do too. And we need to make sure that the urgency of that, again, is not something that is pushed to the side because we will never see the light of day. We will never see the light of day being opening up if we in fact don't make sure that everyone is safe. Uh, and so I just, again, I thank all of you for the work that you're doing. 
I invite each of you to continue to reach out to me where you think I can be helpful, that I can be in partnership. But I know that there's a lot of people just like me who I serve with who also are playing this role. Um, I want to say a really special thank you to CCTV to, um, that has really been an incredible partner in making sure that access to information is really out there. We could not do this um, live town hall every week without their support, so thank you. Um, and, and then I just, you know, I, the, the thing that threw out my mind throughout this, I just kept thinking about was, you know, I, I, I don't know if Marion Wright Edelman was the, the originator of this, but, you know, um, rising tides lift all boats. And that could not be any truer. We will all drown together um, if we do not make sure that we are all taken care of. Um, so I, again, I wanna thank you. I look forward to continuing this work. This was just a conversation, um, and uh, but the work continues. And to each of you, please be as safe as you possibly can. Um, and um, thank you. That, that's, thank you is never gonna be enough. And Roxana, I think about your members and thank you is, a, I, I feel humiliated saying thank you to your members. Um, they didn't go to work looking to be heroes. Um, they didn't go to work looking to be essential workers. You've always known how essential they are in the um, ability to keep us safe, um, but they are trying to feed their families and they are trying to take care of themselves. And now we need to recognize that in a new way. Thank you will never be enough to um, those who are cleaning our buildings cleaning our hospitals, to the frontline staff in the hospital, it will never be enough. To Victoria, the work you're doing with your community and immigrants, not only in Chelsea, because Roca works with people throughout Massachusetts, it will never be enough. Um, the only way it will be enough is to show that we understand the significance of our, um, our, our livelihood is really connected to the work that you're doing. And Mira, who's an incredible organization that allows um, organizations to come together and focus an agenda around supporting immigrants, and Richard, thank you for the work that you do and for the pediatricians who really have always been at the front line calling out the needs of children and their families and the inequities of, um, of and, and the lack of access to care and um, economic security. So we have a lot more work to do. The silver lining that I hope that continues in this is that really some of the stuff that many of you and myself have been advocating for for years and decades has had a bit of a, a steroid injection into that. Our job is to make sure that we don't go back that what we're doing today to recognize our livelihood is actually tied, that that's the reimagining of what the society needs to be moving forward, and that we build on that both today and in the future. So with that, I, I say be well, be safe, and we'll continue talking after this. Thank you. Thanks Thank for you. your advocacy. Thank you for having us. Thank you so much, Thank Rep. You. Decker. This has been tremendous, and, and it's so important to have strong voices like yours advocating for justice right now. It's really, really valuable. Thank you.